Methodist Church. It's good to have all of you with us today. It's good to see some folks returning for the first time in quite a while. Welcome back. And uh, it's also good to have all of those who are uh, still watching online. Welcome as well. As we get started today, we have a few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, today is Palm Sunday, and after the service, those that uh, ordered food, you can pick up your food. There's a missions brunch. Traditionally, we have a missions brunch after church. This year, it's a takeout brunch, and so if you have an order, you can pick that up after the service, and uh, so we hope that you'll take advantage of that as well. Also, we have Good Friday worship, April 2nd at 7 p.m., and then for Easter, we have a brief outdoor Easter worship service in the courtyard at 10 a.m. And then at 10.30, we have our normal indoor Easter worship celebration. And today, at the, we're going to end the service with an anthem from some of the members of our choir who have been, they have not sung together in church for a year. And so they're going to be singing. And then next week, we have some members of the choir that are going to be singing virtually. And uh, Sandy has been working hard to put that together. And she's quite the tech wizard at this point in time. So if you have any computer questions. No. <laughs> but uh, she is, she is uh, stretching herself a bit and she's doing a good job. So we appreciate her creativity with that. Um, let's see here. Also... We have a new Sunday school class starting, a five-week Sunday school class. It's going to start on the Sunday after Easter, April 11th. Starting, they're going to meet from 9.15 to 10. And the subject is, when you can be anything, why be a United Methodist? This is led by Rebecca Goff and is going to reflect on why we uh, become United Methodists as well as reviewing some of our history, theology, in the ways that we do things as a United Methodist Church. So, if you would, uh, or if you if you plan to participate, let the office know. All right, and with that, let us be in a spirit of worship as we open up the prayer. <coughs> Lord, we give you thanks for this day. As we gather together, we pray that we would feel your presence in this place. May we be encouraged, inspired, and challenged as we continue to grow in our faith as we head into Palm Sunday and Holy Week. May we be in touch with your spirit and hear what you would be speaking to us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is on page 278. I invite you to stand. And uh, feel free to wave your palm branches if you have one for Hosanna, loud Hosanna. <laughs>
cell phone number is on there. If you ever want to text them to me, you can do that anytime during the week. And uh, we don't have any concerns except, you know, last week we talked about praying for Marsha Harper. And she was not doing well. And she was, she's doing a lot better right now. So she's had uh, some change in medication. And she is back in her normal room at the care center. And so thank you for your prayers. Uh, but uh, continue to pray for her. It seems to be working. So uh, also, if you are interested in being included in our prayer requests as they happen during the week and hearing more of them that you can pray for, you can be a part of the prayer chain. And if you're interested in that, please contact the church office. All right, let's join together in our prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, indeed, we do give thanks to you for this day. As we gather together and online, and for some of us for the first time in person, we give you thanks. For the ways in which you have sustained us and continue to sustain us. We give you thanks for your son Jesus Christ who gives us hope. And as we think of those in our hearts who are dealing with struggles, whether it be health or stress, whatever it may be, we pray that you would help them to know that they're not alone. For those that are sick, we pray for healing. To those who are weak, strength. And to those who feel hopeless, a sense of peace and renewed hope. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gives us the reason of hope. Who came into this world, showed us how to live. Went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, knowing it wouldn't turn out well for him. Died on the cross rose from the dead on Easter morning. May we take this gospel story, this message with us, especially this week as we go through Holy Week. And may we be reminded that you have shown us your love and your forgiveness. That we may know that we are forgiven of our sin. And that we are loved. It's in your Son's holy name we pray. And we all join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Well, our next hymn is on page 280, All Glory, Lot, and Honor, uh, verses 1, 3, and 5. I invite you to stand. <laughs>
is from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Take the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread the cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet, Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. The second reading, is from Matthew 23, 37, 38. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you, desolate. That is the reading of the gospel. Well, for our children's time, we slash everyone's time. We are continuing our look with the resurrection eggs as we as we have been doing the last several years. And last time we started off, we were in a dark place because Jesus was being hurt. He was being tortured and mocked, and that's not fun for anyone to go through. Maybe you've experienced that before. And Jesus experienced it too. And as we look at the seventh egg, we're, we're looking at three eggs each Sunday for children's time. And as we look at the seventh egg, let's take a look at what's in it. And we already had the, the donkey earlier, even though today's Palm Sunday. But now we have a cross. And even though today is Palm Sunday, we also think about the cross. Because this is the week of Good Friday. And we remember that Jesus was crucified on the cross long ago. But there's a reason we call it Good Friday. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Egg number eight. So loud. We open it up. Open it up, and there's a there's a dice. Uh, which we usually, when we see dice, we think of games, and we play games with a lot of a lot of games with dice. But the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, they weren't playing a game. They were using dice to decide what of Jesus' stuff they would be able to get and keep, and how they could split it up as he lay dying or was hung and dying. And then the last egg for today is number nine. And inside, we have a spear that reminds us that they used a spear to make sure that he was gone. Again, these three eggs are very difficult. They're difficult aspects of the, of the story of Easter because it starts off very negative and very bad. But then it ends with Easter Sunday, with Jesus risen from the dead, victorious over evil. And this story reminds us that when we are going through difficult times, and when we feel as though God is not near, we want to remember that God is near. God is with us all the time. And that just as Jesus 
was vindicated. And what that means is that Jesus, it turned out he was right. And he was victorious over death. So we can know that whatever we are going through, Jesus is with us. And we can still be victorious. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that no matter what we're going through, we know that you're with us. You have been through it all. On Holy Week, we remember that especially. And help us to remember that you are with us. And because you have been through it all, you know what we're going through too. So help us to know that we're never alone. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Next week we'll conclude that. Well, today is the sixth Sunday of Lent. And it is the last Sunday of Lent. And uh, for the past now six Sundays, we have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, different portions of it, looking at some of the greatest teachings of Jesus, and we talked about living the Jesus way. And now, you know, this has been quite a journey, not only because of the things that we've been talking about, but also because it's brought us through quite a change in seasons, as Lent always does. It starts off usually, you know, the worst of winter in February, and this year that was certainly true when we had three brutal weeks of winter, or at least three weekends for sure. And now we are into the spring and the uh, promise of good weather that is coming, at least in our forecast, uh, for tomorrow and next weekend as well. But as we think about this long journey through Lent, we have now come to Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is a Sunday that I always enjoyed as a kid because, I mean, really, where else do you get palm branches in Iowa, right? You know, this is the only time that you get palm branches. So, so it's a unique holiday. And I've always liked Palm Sunday and Easter, though, because they're always very celebratory and in anticipatory of the celebration of Easter, matched perhaps only by Christmas. And yet... Easter and Lent is a little bit different than Christmas because there's also Holy Week. You know, we got to get through Holy Week before we can get to Easter. And Holy Week is not the, the, the not quite as celebratory as Easter is or Christmas. And so we've got a lot to get through from today until next Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday means a lot of different things. There are many layers of meaning to it. Just like when you think about the cross and what the cross means, there's more than one way to talk about that. So in the same way, there are a lot of different ways to think about what Palm Sunday means. And if we're going to understand what took place that day, we need to understand who Jesus claimed to be and how different people understood who he claimed to be. So Jesus, we know... Uh, claimed to be many things. There were many titles that people used for him. Uh, things like Son of God, Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of the World. And these are all titles that we are pretty familiar with. Uh, we, for us, they are religious terms. We think of them as religious terms. But back then, in their context, these were actually politically charged terms, as these were terms used for the Roman Emperor. The emperor was usually called the son of God because it was believed that when they became a ruler, they were adopted or become and have a special relationship with the God or gods. And so they were called a son of God, the savior of the world, king of kings, lord of lords. These are political terms. It would be like if Jesus came to the United States today and claimed to be the president of the United States. Well, we wouldn't think of that as a religious word. We think of that as a very political one. And in the same way, people are claiming and calling Jesus all of these different titles, and they mean different things to different people, right? So, first of all, we have the religious leaders. They don't believe it. You know, they don't believe any of it. Jesus is a, is a phony. They don't think that he matches up. The, and you can't blame them. I mean, in their lifetime, they have seen plenty of people claim similar things, and then it turned out that they were just false prophets. So here comes another person in a long line of persons claiming to be the one, and they don't believe that he is. 
And so there's the religious leaders that don't believe them. And they're also concerned, right? Because, because they are under oppression by Rome. And they don't Rome, want Rome to think that they are trying to rebel. They've seen it happen before. Somebody rises up. They want to rebel. And they gather a following. And they try to rebel against Rome. And Rome comes in and squashes it. They squash that movement. And innocent lives are lost. So the religious leaders, they don't want that to happen again. So they're concerned. They don't believe him, and they're concerned. Then you've got the followers of Jesus, which would include the 12 disciples, but also many others, men and women. And they believe that Jesus, we don't want to say what everyone thought, but many of them took these words literally and politically. And so they believed that Jesus was going to be a great king like King David. And how did King David get his power? Well, he conquered his enemies, right? He conquered his enemies and then united Israel. And that was their glory days, right? The glory days always seem so much better when they're in the past than they do when you're, when you're actually living through them in the present. In fact, the further back in the past you can put those things, the better they become the better they start to look. But if you look back, if you read in the Old Testament during those glory days when King David ruled, it wasn't all great. But, but they were longing for those days. And they said, this is our God. This is it. It's Jesus. He's going he's gonna to bring us back. Because he's going to make us great. And so he's going to be a king like King David. And so you have all these different expectations. And so in comes Jesus into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's been heading this way for a while because if you're going to claim to be king, you can't stay away from the capital forever, right? I mean, Jesus had been to Jerusalem before, but in his ministry, he's mainly been going around in these different places. But eventually, you've got to come to the capital if you're going to proclaim yourself to be king. So they're heading to Jerusalem. And for the followers, for the disciples, this is the moment of truth. Right? He's coming into the capital to proclaim himself king. He's, he's riding on a donkey, which fulfills prophecy. This is the moment of truth when they're going to conquer their enemies, and they're going to reinstate their independence. Hallelujah. So he's coming into Jerusalem, and, and right away we see a, a clash of priorities on display, because we also know we don't know if this happened at the same time or not, but we know that at some point Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, would have been coming into Jerusalem. And he would have been coming in with all the pomp and circumstance of, of, of Rome, with all of their might and power. And he's coming in because, you see, he has to keep control. Because this is a Passover celebration. Now, the Passover is when the Israelites would celebrate their liberation from slavery. And so... You, you have these people that you're, over, you're trying to control and during this celebration of liberation. So Pontius is coming in and Rome is saying, don't try anything during this celebration. Right? We're in charge. And so you have this all this power and might coming in with Pontius Pilate. And then you have Jesus coming in on a donkey. People are putting their cloaks on the ground and they're putting palm branches on the ground for this donkey to walk on. It's always it would be comical if we weren't used to the image because we've grown up with this tradition. But it would be almost comical. You see the stark contrast between the two. But nonetheless, Jesus is getting a crowd of people around him as he comes into Jerusalem because they're excited, right? Some of them because they know what's happening. Some of them because they don't. <laughs> but, but they're excited anyway. But you have some of the followers that they think they know what's happening here. This is the moment of truth. And so they're shouting, Hosanna! Which, once again, is not a religious word. It's political. So it's religious for us now. But it was political then. Hosanna, save us. Save us from who? Rome, of course. Because that's our enemy. Save us from Rome. Liberate us. Just as God did for us long ago in Passover. And so these people are... Are, are coming around him and praising him for what they think he's going to do. And then you've got the religious leaders who are getting more and more nervous, right? Because there's a parade for crying out loud. 
And the more this grows, the more nervous they get. They feel they have to put a stop to this somehow. And that leads them to the crucifixion ultimately. But then we've got Jesus who's weeping. What in the world? He's weeping. He's crying as he comes into Jerusalem. Why? Because he knows that the people are not going to heed his teaching. They're not they're not going to turn the other cheek. They're not going to avoid revenge. They're not going to love their enemies, Rome. Instead, he knew, and as he predicted during his ministry, later, in 66 AD, a group of zealots would rebel against Rome. And as a result, Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem, ending Judaism as they knew it in that time period. In around 70 AD. So Jesus knew that this wasn't going to turn out well. Jesus also knew this wasn't going to turn out well for him. He knew it was going to lead to his death. It wasn't going to lead to his, his crowning as a literal king like King David. He was going to be proclaimed king, but hanging from a cross. You know, he told them such before he even got into Jerusalem. He told the disciples, he said that we're going to go into Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed. But then I'm going to raise, rise from the dead. And the rising from the dead thing, it didn't cancel out the killing. And Peter pulls him aside and he says, you know, you got to stop talking like that. Because that's crazy talk, you know. And we know what. We can maybe identify with Peter. How do people gain influence in the world? How do people lead? They don't lead by being humiliated and killed. They lead well, we know how they lead, oftentimes with power and might and sometimes with violence. Conquering your enemies. And so Jesus pulls them aside and says, that's not going to work, Jesus. You can't do that. And, of course, in some versions of the gospel, he says, get behind me, Satan. You know, because you don't have in mind the things of, of man, God, but the things of man. But, but he says to not only Peter, but the other followers as well, he says... Those who want to follow me must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. We're so used to spiritualizing that language, you know, the cross is all the burdens in our life and things like that. But we forget that back then that would have been taken literally. When he meant cross, he meant a wooden beam that you were nailed to. So, you know, when he said deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him, that is a, an absurd message. I mean, that's just an absurd message. You know, this is not a great way to start a church or to grow a church. But you will never see Jesus give a pitch that says, follow me and I'm going to make your life awesome and you are not going to have to sacrifice anything. You follow me and all your problems will go away. Jesus doesn't, he never over promises. You know, he, he doesn't say any of those things that he knows are true. In fact, sometimes your problems can come because you are following Jesus. But it certainly is not a guarantee you won't have them. No, he says instead that you will have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. Now, we'll, we, get, we will get to the glory and the resurrection and the celebration and the victory next Sunday at Easter. But the thing is that when we follow Jesus, when we try to live the Jesus way, we have to follow him first to the clash of priorities that takes place on Palm Sunday, and then the embarrassment of the cross on Good Friday. You see, this was an embarrassing message for many people back then. It was a, they call it a stumbling block. People couldn't get over it. You see, back in those days, gods were powerful. Back in those days, gods like Zeus and others, you know, if you've seen artistic depictions of gods, they would be mighty and powerful, and they'd have thunderbolts that they would throw, and they'd look angry. And here's Jesus saying, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross. That's not, and, and here you have a group of people who say, oh, our Messiah was humiliated and killed by the Romans. Come follow us. <laughs> and the whole resurrection thing, it didn't make it less offensive. It didn't make it less offensive. This is why we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, who famously wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
for it is the salvation, it is the power of salvation. And so he said that because the message was difficult to understand. Power through death, power through vulnerability. This doesn't make any sense. But Paul said that this is the power of salvation. And he also said elsewhere, I have decided to know nothing but Christ crucified. See, if you want to know Christ most fully, if you want to know God, what God is like most fully, look at Jesus on the cross, and you've got the clearest picture of God that you will ever see. Now, in our tradition, we usually have empty crosses, right? Because that emphasizes that Jesus is no longer there, that he is resurrected, and that's powerful. But it can also be meaningful to look at a crucifix. So a crucifix is a cross that has Jesus on it. In our tradition, we're not used to that. So if you haven't seen one for a while, I mean, then when you look at one, it can be kind of startling if you're not used to it. But the crucifix, in, especially in Roman Catholic tradition and then some other church traditions as well, is very common. And when you see Jesus on the cross, that is the clearest picture of God that you will ever see. And here's the thing. What we see is that this God would rather die than kill his enemies. Keep that in mind. This God would rather die than kill his enemies. The next time you feel the need for revenge, remember that. As Jesus said as he was dying on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They know what they're doing. That's what I want to say. They know exactly what they're doing. Well, they don't know exactly who Jesus is. But they're nailing a person to a cross for crying out loud. They know what they're doing. But Jesus says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He is showing the greatness of his love. And we see it no more clearly than when he's dying on the cross. And so, you know, as we think about the Sermon on the Mount that we've been looking at this last six weeks, this stuff will get you crucified. You know, turning the other cheek, loving your enemy, praying for those who persecute you, uh, not seeking revenge, and all of these teachings that we have, we've been going over. That'll get you crucified. Look at Jesus if you don't believe me. Look at Jesus and what happened to him. He got crucified because of it. Because he refused to, to stand up. He refused to be what we stereotypically would call a hero in, in our current culture. A hero. The strong one. The one who's going to fight back. The one who's going to overpower his enemies. You know, he'd rather die. He'd rather die than be like that. And so the way of Jesus, living the Jesus way, it's countercultural, it's counterintuitive, it's it's not easy. That's why he calls it the narrow path. Because not everybody wants to do it. And he, you know, he never as I said, he'd never give a pitch and say, Your life is gonna be so awesome if you follow me. No, he would say, You need to count the cost if you're gonna follow. But here's what Jesus also said. He also said that he is a source of peace. He says that he will help us carry our burdens. He says that he is the living water, that he is the bread of life, that he is the good shepherd who leads us through the valleys. He said that he is, he is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. And we know that he is victorious over sin and hell and death. And yes, Jesus was proclaimed king, just not in the way that we stereotypically think of it. He was proclaimed king on the cross and then vindicated in his resurrection. And so living the Jesus way, it's not easy to know. But salvation, God's love, it has all been given to us as grace. Because of what happened before any of us were even born. And when we respond and we say, yes, I will follow that narrow path. It's not easy, but we don't go it alone because Jesus is with us. And do you remember a parable, a story that was told about the pearl of great price? And there was a person who found this pearl in a field. And so he sold everything he had to get this, this pearl of great price. When I read that story, I think, 
I don't know if that was really a wise idea because now all you have is this pearl, but you don't have anything else. What are you going to do with it? You going to just look at it, you, you know? Or are you going to sell it to get shelter? And then what's the point? But the point is not to overthink it, as I tend to do. The point is not to stretch out the parables to where they no longer make any sense. The point that was being made is that finding Jesus is more valuable than anything else in our lives. More valuable than any quick fix. More valuable than any, any solutions that promise things that cannot be delivered. Jesus is that great pearl. Jesus is that, that thing that is, he's worth more than anything else that the, this life may have to offer. And so, as we continue in this journey of this last week of Lent, uh, remember, we will focus more on the cross on Good Friday, and then we're going to focus on the victory that Jesus had over death on Easter Sunday. But I would encourage you to remember that Jesus does not necessarily promise us easy street. But he does say that no matter what you're going through, he will be with you. And that he is the most important, valuable thing, or person, I should say, that you will ever have in your life. And so seek him as the pearl of great price, because that's what he is. Amen. Now is the time when we would normally have our offering, but you know, pretty much know this feel now, as we've been doing for the last year. We uh, encourage you to give your offering at the end of the service, and we give you thanks for the ways in which you support the mission and ministries of the church. Uh, but during this time, I'm going to invite you to stand as we join in the doxology and our offertory prayer. <laughs>
and he is exalted. I'm going to let you guys get started.